gives me great pleasure to welcome our next keynote speaker, and that is Arkana Kotecha, Head of Legal at Liberty Asia. Uh, Arkana and I were having a good old chat just beforehand, and Arkana um, said, Anson, don't introduce me as a millennial. I am not a millennial. So both of us... I think that's quite visible, isn't it? No, it's not. It's not. Both of us are just post-millennial. How's that? We're just post-millennial. Also, Arcana also started out life at KPMG. Woo! Woo. Anyway, that, that, I just wanted to make a point there. Um, but, of course, you used to be in Salisbury Square at, in, in Fleet Street in London. But as I said, really, we have to be thinking about, not just about the sustainability issues, but all of these corporate social responsibility issues, because it's also about our people. Ladies and gentlemen, give a very, very warm French welcome, Arcana Kotecha. I did wonder when would be the first time today when my name would be said incorrectly. And I did tell him before we started that this is how we say it. So um, I'll forgive you. Um, Archna Kotecha. So how many of you in the room are parents? Can I see by a show of hands? Not many, actually. So maybe we might be some of the oldest people in the room. Um, so there's a thing called the good cop and the bad cop routine at home. I'm usually the bad cop. And it's no exception today. I'm here to be the bad cop again. And I'm sad to say that actually from a human rights perspective, um, the human rights movement is way, way, way behind the environmental movement. Most of my job on a daily basis involves me working with governments, but also engaging with members of the private sector, mostly those based in Southeast Asia, and working with NGOs supporting very vulnerable uh, individuals, mostly migrant workers, who are suffering from some form of exploitation or the other. For the last 15 years, I've been working in the space of counter-trafficking, working with victims of human trafficking, modern-day slavery, and forced labor. So I want to give you today my take on what transparency means. In doing our job every day, some of the issues that people who fall into the supply chain exploitative situations face are this. If they try to raise their voice uh, through an operational grievance mechanism, the voice is often silenced because there is actually um, no effective operation grievance mechanism for them to uh, have their voices heard. If you try to go to court to enforce uh, your rights, the chances are that you get stuck in an extremely lengthy court process, very difficult to access legal assistance, very difficult to be able to see the court case through because there's often intimidation, there's violence um, against these workers. Often the companies bring claims against the workers for criminal defamation. So in, in situations like that, where there is often a very restricted freedom to associate, so they can't form trade unions, especially if they're migrant workers, these individuals are left with very, very little opportunities but to submit to abuse. A lot of this abuse exists in supply chains globally, and I think the time has run out for corporates to say it's a complex issue. We've moved on from talking about corporate social responsibility in our world. Today, I speak to you not as a human rights advocate, but I speak to you about serious legal and regulatory risks, not about ethical issues, but account about accountability. And I sincerely hope that someday we will get to the point where our world cares as much about other human beings as they do about the endangered white rhinos. So here we go, what's the scale of the problem? 40.3 million people are estimated to be in conditions of modern day slavery today. Over 66% of this number live and are exploited in Asia on our doorstep. 24.9 million individuals uh, work in conditions of forced labor globally. It, look at the statistics at the bottom of the page. This is $150 billion revenue. And most of the profits are generated per individual in forced labor in Asia. This is just to give you a snapshot, in case we all forgot how complex this issue is. This is a snapshot based on some work we did in the fishing industry, just to give you an idea of how complex supply chains can be 
in this area. And this, this uh, as I said, relates to fishing um, in, in Southeast Asia. So what is happening from the transparency perspective that is giving us some hope? Well, the world we're living in has changed very quickly. We've seen two types of uh, disclosure regimes evolve. One, which is the Modern Slavery Act type, the California Transparency and Supply Chains Act. They basically say to corporations, you need to tell us what you've been doing to combat slavery in your supply chain. So it's a question of writing up a disclosure, putting it somewhere public, and having a director or board of directors sign it. We've seen from the Modern Slavery Act that the quality of statements has been very patchy. There have been quite a few that have been pretty robust, but many others where no director has even signed them. Um, they're lost somewhere on the website. And in addition to that, they've very clearly been copied and pasted from somebody else's statement. And in terms of enforcement to that type of disclosure, the enforcement is pretty weak. If somebody, somebody could put in a statement saying, I'm sorry, we don't do anything at all and that's considered to be an acceptable disclosure. Now, the second type of disclosure that has emerged has emerged from jurisdictions like France and many other countries in Europe, which is a lot harder. And I have to salute the French for this because you know, it was hugely exciting when it was, the plans were announced, and we'll talk about that in a, in a lot more detail in a minute. But those types of disclosures are about risk. It's aimed at uh, companies disclosing what risks exist within their supply chain and how they plan to mitigate those risks. The other changes that we've seen uh, happen is slave sort of, there's been so much focus on modern day slavery and it's also a sustainable development goal 8.7. Uh, national action plans are now being required of governments across the world in relation to business and human rights. What this has meant is that there's been a very strong focus on small and medium-sized enterprises because it's acknowledged that a lot of the problems exist at that level. Uh, there's been an EU resolution very much in, 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 uh, sort of in, in the same vein as the French law, very strong in terms of traceability um, and where, um, where goods are coming from. We now have uh, legislation like the Global Magnitsky Act, which is a, an American uh, piece of legislation, and the UK Criminal Finances Act. And the point of these acts is to basically say this. If you have assets within our jurisdiction that are there or that have been created by direct or in, indirectly profiting from gross human rights abuses anywhere in the world, we can seize those. In fact, the Global Magnitsky Act has just been applied to a Pakistani gentleman, a doctor, who had assets in the United States and who uh, has just been done for organ trafficking. So we are already seeing that there is a lot of appetite to apply this legislation. And now the question is, how does this relate to you guys? Well, the point is it says directly or indirectly. And at this point in time, there will be litigation to test what this means. Could this mean a company that is much further down the supply chain, a brand that is commissioning uh, some of this? Could it mean the bank that is actually financing um, a company that is very well aware that these activities are taking place? So this is very much an open space at the moment and there will be um, litigation developing here. Now, from, a, from another perspective, um, I'll talk you through some of the cases that we are seeing globally, legal cases parent liability has emerged as a big issue. This has been highlighted in, in the French um, law. And um, the duty of vigilance, which was, was very exciting, as I said, takes everything a notch above uh, the Modern Slavery Act and the California Act. And the, the interesting thing about this is that for the first time, it contemplates that a parent can be held liable for actions of a subsidiary, a supplier, or a contractor that is way further down the supply chain. And it also gives the right to an aggrieved third party anywhere in the world that has been impacted by this supply chain to bring a case in France against the parent company. This, ladies and gentlemen, is a game changer. We've never seen legislation like this before. Um, and it's, it's relatively new. It will be a, a little bit of time before it's tested and we see how well it is enforced. But it is an exciting opportunity. And it's an exciting opportunity not because of the cases that could come out of it, but because of the action the parent company might take to protect itself throughout its supply chain and the pressure that it might put further down the supply chain for change to happen. 
we are seeing very similar laws being looked at in the Netherlands in relation to child labor, uh, but also in Switzerland as well. Now, what has happened as a result of, of all of these laws? We've seen lots of things happen. There's been prolific legal action by consumers. We've seen alliance building across stakeholders. So we've seen business, NGOs, banks, a whole load of people come together in various sectors. Unfortunately, as you know, a lot of the work in our part of the world is reactive. We have to wait for Rana Plaza to collapse to actually look into health and safety for workers. We have to wait for a shoe factory in Cambodia to fall apart before we do something about it. So we react a lot. And if there is an investigative report in, in Reuters about slavery in the Thai industry, then we decide, oh, well, let's, let's all pile in and look into what's happening there. So, you know, a, a lot of the alliance building has happened after incidents have been reported or things have happened. There are so many sectors globally that have not yet had that kind of attention turned to them. And I guess, you know, from an NGO perspective, we're always trying to find ways to communicate information to important people. And, you know, when I, when I talk about the pressure being on from a disclosure perspective for companies, it's not just on companies that there is pressure. The banks and the financial institutions are feeling a lot of heat at the moment. There is a lot of pressure on them by international regulators, by their national regulators, on what they're doing to account for 150 billion US dollars that relates to slavery, um, people who are enslaved. So the banks are also coming under pressure to look at the types of businesses they are banking, the types of loans they're making, and the kind of environmental, human, and social footprint that those loans are, are, are going to be uh, leaving. So supply chain finance, asset management, investors, everybody is taking a very keen interest in this issue. I don't know if some of you would have seen, but the CEO of Blackstone um, made a very strong statement, basically saying that a company's success should be judged not by its profit margin, but by the social imprint that the company leaves. And um, we, are see, we are certainly seeing a big push uh, from investors in terms of stakeholder activism. So they'll show up at the AGM, they'll kick up a lot of noise if there are certain aspects of um, the social and environmental standards that are not being very well respected. One of the things um, that you know, I want to stress is transparency is not accountability. Transparency is making it much clearer what is going on. It is creating the space for accountability, but it is not accountability itself. God, time flies really quick when you're up here. Um, and, um, you know, I just wanted to talk you through some of the cases we're seeing. So the, these, there have been a whole host of consumer cases in, brought by consumers in the United States under California transparency against people like Nestle, Costco, Hershey's, Mars, etc. And the courts in all of those cases have, uh, the cases were brought on the basis that hey, we bought your stuff not knowing that slaves contributed to it, we would have not bought it otherwise. So the court said that the purpose of companies making disclosures is not so that consumers can use it to target them. Therefore, none of these cases have been successful. Um, another one was seven victims who were Cambodian nationals trafficked onto a shrimp processing plant in Thailand, brought a case in the United States. So we're seeing a much bigger trend of cases being brought in other jurisdictions as well, where there is a connection. This particular case didn't, uh, was not successful at first instance because there wasn't enough evidence suggesting um, the link of the companies. And it was complex because the corporate structure was especially complex in this particular case. Some of the other exciting developments are in the UK, we've seen uh, in the Vedanta case, for example, that a parent company um, has been held accountable and its duty of care was found to extend to its subsidiary. In Canada, a group of Eritrean workers are being granted the right to bring a case relating to modern day slavery against a Canadian company because they were employed by the subsidiary in Eritrea. It's, a, it's the first of, of its kind. And of course, many of you will have heard of the recent criminal indictments of the former uh, executives of Lafarge uh, in France because of their alleged complicity for human rights violations in Syria. So, you know, this, this is really get becoming a very active space. And from a, a, a legal risk and a regulatory perspective, uh, this is as stark as it gets. And also very recently, an NGO in France has filed a lawsuit against Samsung for um, 
again, representing that they had very good worker standards when actually that was not the case and violations of fundamental rights were found in factories in China and South Korea. And again, you can see there's an effort to use French courts uh, to hold multinationals accountable. In Canada today, we have the first ever ombudsperson for responsible business. And by the way, Canada and Australia are tipped to be signing the Modern Slavery Act next. Australia will come first and then Canada. Uh, interestingly, nobody decided to follow the French example, uh, which we're quite devastated about. So again, it will be a low level of disclosure where companies are just disclosing what um, efforts they're making. So they could just say, we have a code of conduct, we do a bit of training, and that's a good enough disclosure. Um, the watchdog in Canada can actually uh, refer any evidence of criminal wrongdoing to the police. They can open their own investigations. Um, they're initially targeting oil and gas and garment uh, sectors. Uh, this is also welcome news from a government that has for the longest of time focused its energies on combating sex trafficking as opposed to labor trafficking. And in the United States, we are seeing that uh, of the 120 developing countries that export to the US, the US are now saying that they're going to uh, look at labor standards that are applied in those countries. And if those countries don't honor labor standards, then they will, they will not be allowed to export tax-free to the United States. Now, the point of, of going through all of this um, with you is just to say that times are changing. We are running out of time. The writing is on the wall. The regulations are going to only get more and more stringent. And the world is shrinking. So a parent sitting in France is no longer safe from the liabilities of a subsidiary or a joint venture, venture in China. Every day there is more and more news. As, as I was coming here, there was a, there was a story about um, a construction company, a Hong Kong-related construction company in um, Honolulu that was just held accountable um, for violations um, relating to human trafficking against a whole bunch of Chinese workers. They've just been ordered to, to pay close to 19 million US dollars worth of reparations to the workers. Um, the London Metal Exchange announced a few days ago that they would suspend from trading on the exchange companies that were not up to industry standard. This was as a result of um, a huge outcry last week because of children um, in the Democratic Republic of Congo being used to mine cobalt. So the regulators are taking action. The governments are taking this relatively seriously, depending which part of the world you, you look into. The point is that for, for corporates that are there to do business, for the longest of time we've heard that the paradigm always is we need to care about risk to business. Let me tell you this. Risk to people is the ultimate risk to business. And we are, we are at a point in time where unless people get their house in order, there will be trouble. We've seen the first fines being given out to banks for violating um, uh, risk processes that account for human trafficking proceeds. Western Union was fined last year by the US regulator. We've seen, you've heard how many pieces of legislation there are all of which aim at increasing transparency um, and accountability. And it won't be very long before consumers take it upon themselves, and they're already doing so, to hold, to use these spaces of transparency to hold corporations accountable. So while you can, please get your house in order. Time is running out. Thank you. My, uh, my apologies for it's getting okay. the name wrong. Um, it's happened more than once, as you can imagine. Yes, yeah. yes. Now, we, I asked the question to a number of the speakers, and I've just been hearing a very sobering view of, of the business world. What do we need to do when we leave this conference today? What's the one thing? Go back, look at the processes you have in place. Um, and, and recalibrate the thinking a little bit, because when you, if you have an operational grievance mechanism, go take another look at it. As companies go to operate in areas where there is weak rule of law, where there are not many opportunities for workers to seek justice, there is an enhanced responsibility on companies that operate in those areas, both from a due diligence perspective and from a remediation perspective. 
So go back, look at your risk processes, get better at risk management, because you're going to need it. Okay. Ladies and gentlemen, please join me giving a very warm thank you.